Good evening, everyone. I'm Margaret Andera, the Interim Chief Curator and Curator of Contemporary Art at the Milwaukee Art Museum. After months of anticipation, I am pleased to welcome you all tonight as we open the exhibition, Susan Micellis, Through a Woman's Lens, here at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Though I cannot see all of you in our audience this evening, I'm so glad you have joined us for our first virtual exhibition opening. We are grateful for your support as members, which allows us to offer programs that engage the community, conduct conservation and scholarship around the remarkable works in the museum's collection, create educational resources for students from kindergarten to aspiring art historians, and host exhibitions like the one we're celebrating tonight. Now more than ever, thank you for your support in making everything this institution does possible. This evening, we are joined by artist Susan Micellis and Lisa Sutcliffe, the curator of Susan Micellis Through a Woman's Lens. Lisa is the Hertzfeld Curator of Photography and Media Arts here at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Previously, she served as Assistant Curator of Photography at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art and co-curatorial fellow at the De Cordova Sculpture Park and Museum in Lincoln, Massachusetts. She holds an MA in the History of Art from Boston University, where she specialized in the history of photography and a BA in art history from Wellesley College. Lisa has organized numerous exhibitions since joining the Milwaukee Art Museum, including Sarah Swinar, Image Model Muse, the, Sw the San Quentin Project, Nigel Poor and the Men of San Quentin State Prison, Rinica Dijkstra, Rehearsals, Penelope Umbrico, Future Perfect, among many others. Susan Mizellis, an American photographer born in 1948, has spent nearly five decades documenting human stories. A member of the International Photographic Cooperative Magnum Photos since 1976, Micellus works in a participatory manner that honors her collaborators and the people she photographs. She often builds relationships and deep connections to bring their voices to the fore. For Micellus, this project process of immersion is key to approaching the people she works with, understanding their perspectives and making pictures that reveal complicated truths. This close attention to the relationships she builds reflects her understanding of the responsibility of connecting the people in her photographs to a broader audience and her long-standing interest in interrogating the ethics of seeing. In 2019, Micellus received the Deutsche Börse Photography Foundation Prize for her survey show, Mediations, which was organized with the Jus de Palme in Paris and later traveled to the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. She has received numerous other awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship in 1992. This exhibition, Susan Micellis Through a Woman's Lens, presents never before shown photographs alongside iconic series that reflect the artist's ongoing commitment to sharing the stories of women. Susan, Susan's work seeks to bear witness to the stories that might otherwise go unnoticed. Before I hand the evening over to Lisa and Susan for what is sure to be an engaging and insightful conversation, I want to thank everyone who came together to make this exhibition possible. From the Milwaukee Art Museum, I first want to thank Lisa Sutcliffe, who has navigated the uncharted waters of curating an exhibition during the time of COVID-19. Thank you for your perseverance and dedication to this project, Lisa. Thanks also to Ariel Pate, Assistant Curator of Photography, for her heroic efforts in support of every aspect of the exhibition. To David Russick, the museum's chief designer, for his work on the exhibition installation. To our virtual experience team, Dustin Dupree and Ted Brusabartis, who created the beautiful 360 degree virtual experience of the exhibition. And to staff from nearly every department across the institution. We also extend our gratitude to Susan for remaining flexible and committed to this presentation at the museum as we navigated the impact of COVID-19 on our exhibition schedule. Susan also worked tirelessly with Lisa to record over six hours of audio to support the virtual exhibition and audio guide. Thanks also to Susan's studio team, Luciano Pinciero and Jessica Ball for their, for their assistance. 
Thank you to, Susan, to Susan's collaborators, some of whom allowed us to interview them for their virtual tour and who join us this evening. To Magnum Photographs for their collaboration and to Pauline Vermar for her guidance and some support. And to the lenders to the exhibition for sharing their works of art with us. Thank you to the sponsors of the exhibition. First and foremost, we want to thank the Hertzfeld Foundation the curatorial support for and exhibitions in the Hertzfeld Center for Photography and Media Arts are possible with your support. Thank you to our supporting sponsor, Northern Trust, our contributing sponsor, David C. and Sarah Jean Ruttenberg Arts Foundation, and thank you to our community partners, Lotus Legal and Sojourner Family Peace Center. We also want to thank the museum's visionaries, the visionaries are a very special group of donors that underwrite the year of exhibitions, allowing us to look more broadly at our exhibition schedule, as well as the connections between exhibitions, programs, and the community. A special thank you for the steadfast support of Donald and Donna Baumgartner, John and Murph Burke, Sheldon and Marianne Lubar, Joel and Karen Quadrachi, Sue and Bud Selig, and Jeff Yabuki, and the Yabuki Family Foundation. And again, thanks to all of you. It is the unwavering support and involvement of our members that makes so much possible. And now I will hand the program over to Lisa. Lisa. Thank you so much, Margaret. Hello, I'm Lisa Sutcliffe, Hertzfeld Curator of Photography and Media Arts at the Milwaukee Art Museum. And I wanna echo Margaret's thanks to our sponsors, lenders and members, and thank you all so much for joining me tonight in what I hope will be an engaging conversation with a true feminist icon, Susan Micellis. 2020 marks the 100th anniversary of the ratification of the 19th Amendment, giving women the right to vote. And so it is an opportune moment to honor and examine the legacy of Susan Micellis, a woman whose commitment to collaborative practice has made such an enduring mark on photography. Mycellus is not just a photographer, but an important voice and mentor in the field. Collaboration is central, not only to her practice, but to her working process and indeed her way of living. As the president of, Magnum of, the, of the Magnum Foundation, she has mentored and supported a new generation of diverse photographic voices. And as an artist, she continually returns to conversation with the people she photographed, whether she has known them for 50 years or five minutes. As her collaborator on this exhibition over the past few years, I have the honor to attest that she is a generous partner and a true joy to work with. When this exhibition was postponed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, rather than seeing this as a challenge, we began to envision the opportunities a virtual tour might offer. And we spent the past six months combing Susan's archive to create an experience that provides an opportunity to examine her photographic career more deeply to hear from the artist, the people she photographed and her collaborators, examine related publications and ephemera and watch historical films and interviews that provide context for the artist process. You should have all received a link to the virtual tour which will be made available to the public on the museum's website tomorrow, December 4th. After tonight's conversation, Susan and I will show you how to navigate this virtual experience. And for us, the creation of this tour has been a real silver lining in a challenging year and I hope you will enjoy exploring everything it has to offer. Susan and I deliberated the title of this exhibition and I think we were both somewhat uncomfortable with it, but I'd like to use it as a way in which to consider her perspective as we examine both her photographic and collaborative practice and discover how she ultimately sought to move beyond being defined as a woman photographing women. This exhibition focuses on an aspect of the early period of Susan's work in which guided by her own intuition, she focused on the lives and perspectives of women on the edges of the mainstream, narratives that might have been otherwise overlooked. Many of the pictures taken in the 1970s record the moment during which they were made when women were asking important questions about gender equality and their roles in the home, in politics, and in the world. From sorority girls, strippers, and beauty queens to boxers and delegates, these women shatter the narrow spectrum of female representation that predominated in visual culture. Together, the pictures present a portrait not only of, a woman at the, of, not only of women at the time, but also of an artist coming of age during the women's movement who understood the challenges women faced, including the structures that limited their opportunities. The exhibition considers this period as a foundation for her documentary practice, grounded in collaboration and immersion. 
and for her constant exploration of how photography might act as a platform to bring the stories, not just of women, but of people on the periphery to a larger audience. Most exciting for me is the presentation of photographs that have never been seen before and an opportunity um, to discuss them more in depth this evening. So before we get started, I want to ask you um, to change the way you're using Zoom to a side-by-side -side gallery view, which will be um, optimal for viewing our conversation. And to remind you that if you have questions, you can leave them in the question and answer box at the bottom of your screen, and we will have a question and answer period following our conversation. And now it is my pleasure to invite Susan Mizellis to join us. Hi, Susan. Hi, Lisa. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So Susan, I'm so thrilled to have a chance to talk to you tonight. And um, for me, I think um, one of the most exciting things about putting this exhibition together was the chance to unearth some of the photographs uh, from your archive that I had never seen before and I didn't know about. Um, and so I'm just gonna show a few of them here. Um, in particular, this photograph that you took in New York um, during the DNC in 1976, when of course the ERA was something that was being discussed. Um, and it's interesting to consider that given that Milwaukee was meant to be the host of the DNC this summer, which of course didn't happen due to COVID. But, um, you know, if you visit the, th the virtual exhibition on our website, you will get to hear Susan talk a little bit about this image and also about um, its relationship to her at that time. And so I do hope we're not going to have a chance to talk about everything tonight, but I do hope that everyone who is watching will spend some time um, listening to Susan talk about all of these pictures in depth in our virtual tour. So um, one of the things about this era of photographs that was so interesting to me, these pictures that you took in the 1970s and 1980s, was how you were interested in how women were defining themselves. Um, and I think in particular, um, the way they used their bodies or presented their bodies. Um, on the left is a photograph from a Miss Nude competition in Atlantic City in 1976. So right around the same time you were making your well-known series Carnival Strippers. And to me, it's a picture that really kind of evokes the idea of patriarchy, that you have these women on stage in a sort of cookie cutter kind of um, body shape with their tan lines. Um, and then in front of them, they have this kind of hulking guy with his tie and his, his cigarette dangling um, just in the sort of the lights of the orchestra almost. Um, and then interesting to compare that to the picture on the right of the bodybuilders who are interested in their bodies in a very different kind of way. And then the other pictures from earlier in the exhibition are um, these pictures from the 70s uh, on the left, a sorority in Madison, Wisconsin and on the right backstage at the Miss Nude competition. And so one of the things I began to notice in looking at these pictures was this interest you had that was almost ethnographic in social rituals and in the way women prepare themselves for presentation and per for performance, which I think is something we'll talk about quite a bit this evening as we, as we look at, at your pictures. And then that brings us to um, the sort of question, the, the central question I think that you ask in photography, which is, um, the role of, of sort of relationship of building, the, the role of building a relationship when you make a portrait. And so these are pictures you made in Marrakesh. And I wonder if you wanna tell us a little bit about um, the making of these pictures and the questions that, that led you to making them. Um, I just wanna give everyone a sense of what they come from. This is um, an installation view from 20 Durham's or one photo, which was installed in Marrakesh. Um, but you can see here two details, uh, one of a woman who has veiled her face and one of a woman who has not. But you're asking a really central question about portraiture in this, in this um, series. And I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, I think, you know, to begin, it's, um, it's this question of whether or not a photograph is a record of a relationship. So in a way, this series um, is partly a record of my inability when I landed in Marrakesh to make a connection to people 
initially and feeling as if I was, I was like any other tourist and it wasn't so clear that, in, they, that they wanted photographs to be made in fact. So the tension about the act of photography brought me into a kind of different way of working, which was I set up an open air kind of salon and uh, with two young Mar women from Mar Morocco who were assisting me in the spice market, the women's spice market in the center of Marrakesh. And we were asking the question of whether or not people, these women wanted a photograph, if a photograph itself was of value to them, the object of a photograph, or whether or not they wanted to be, and they're, they wanted to be paid essentially to have a photograph made of them. And so the installation, if you go back to that view, um, records the relationship in reverse. In other words, the photographs you see on the wall are those that I paid for and they in exchange offered the photograph for the gallery view. And when you see the money on the wall, that's the amount of money it would cost to make an, a, essentially a, an ID photo in a local studio. And so the money remains on the wall, meaning with me and they receive the photograph. So you can see that right away it puts in question uh, that kind of a transaction. Who, who is a photograph for? What's its value? Not just economic value, but it's social, psychological. That's a question that I go on asking. You know, who does it uh, live for? Who lives within it? How what kind of exchange is it? And what is exchanged in the making of a portrait? Exactly. And that little blackboard on the right was in Arabic explaining they had to choose before we made the photographs, they had to choose whether or not they wanted the photograph or they wanted the 20 dirhams. So that, that was just a kind of experiment for a day. Um, and I think it's interesting in, in relation to what um, the pictures I was talking about earlier, that there's the sense of you kind of finding these women who interest you in certain ways because they are either um, bodybuilders or they are in a Miss Nude competition, but in some way they're sort of testing the boundaries of what's expected of women versus going to a place where taking a picture of a woman can be problematic and figuring out ways to do that, that feel um, interesting, that you're asking questions that are relevant to them and offering them a service in a way. Well, I'm also asking them to make a choice about participating or not participating and the ways in which they participate and um, you know whether they're covered or uncovered. It, of course, there's the full variation of what you might find in Marrakesh at that time, but. I think the important thing is um, it's an act of choice. And I think that's, that's the point of intersection. You know, the photograph is that juncture point where mm -hmm. we come together, it bridges us and it also separates us. And I think the idea of a bridge is an important one. And before we move on, I just wanna mention that within the virtual tour, we did interview your collaborators, Iman Barakat and Leila Hida. So I hope that um, our, audience members will spend some time listening to them because I think a true point of, of this exhibition and of your work is that you know you are a collaborator and that you bring people into that process. And so um, I do hope people will go and listen to that. But speaking of the idea of a bridge, I wanna sort of bring us to this self-portrait that you made um, when you were living in um, Cambridge and at Harvard University in graduate school um, where you, used a four by five camera to make portraits in the, the boarding house where you were living at the time. Um, but I think that this self-portrait really sets the stage for who you are as a photographer. And, and the idea of a bridge um, is one that I would sort of prompt you with here and, and what you see when you look at this picture. And maybe if you can even recall what you were thinking when you made it. Of course I can't. <laughs> <laughs> I'd forgotten totally I'd made the photograph until we rediscovered it. A some time ago, I think, you know, this sense of, um, I, I was part of 44 Irving Street. It was a boarding house. I didn't know my no neighbors very well. So I wanted to be present amongst them, even though we didn't know each other. Um, but I think, you know, what this suggests is a kind of physical and an absence and a presence. What I think the, if I'm thinking, it's also a psychological state of mind, you know, I'm both, I'm, a, I'm 
not trying to be in myself. I'm trying to be connecting to others. And somehow, I don't know why this picture just stands symbolically for that very tenuous state of mind and state of being that I think is central to all of my work really. Um, so I'm not in, in denial that I'm present, but I don't want the work to be about me. It of course is a reflection of me. It's my obsessions. It's my curiosities that lead me places, but I want also to be, be that bridge to other people connecting to others. And in a way it's a portrait of the transparency that's necessary mm -hmm. for immersion and for really becoming a vehicle for the voice of your subject, which I think is something that is very important to, to your process. Mm. So um, the pictures from 44 Irving Street are also about what a photograph lacks in a way. Um, and so there's the central question you're asking, you take these portraits, but then how do you get the voice of the subject? And so I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about, about what we're seeing here. Yeah, I actually wasn't, I wasn't using the word voice because of course this is written, but I think the question was, how am I seeing you and how do you see yourself differently than I or the camera sees you, portrays you? Um, this is Joan and I still remember the moment that she wanted to look through the lens to see what the landscape was going to be and wanted to make sure her guitar was in the picture, <laughs> you know, and I'm under a black cape, you know, seeing the image upside down. I mean, it was the first time I'd used a four by five and probably the last actually. <laughs> and so um, when I brought the contact sheet back to, to Joan, she began writing about just this was and wasn't, you know, I don't think the photo of me really gives the essence of me. There she is writing that. And I felt that claim that, that was the act of inclusion. You know, that was the exchange, just to understand what I was doing and, and how someone else might feel about it. So this is all interconnected, of course, even though they're decades separating Marrakesh and 44 Irving Street. And when I'm making these photographs, I have no idea I'll be a photographer in, for, for that many decades, for sure, you know. And it's a, it's a way in which you still work today. I mean, even the title wall of the exhibition is all of the notebooks you, you carried with you for all of your projects. I mean, I think it's something that reflects your interest in recording as well as um, the words as much as the images. Mm. And that brings us to um, the role of education. And I think, um, you know, you were working in the Bronx and you went down to, um, South Carolina um, to be an artist in residence and were teaching and made these pictures, which I, I'm not sure many people know about, but they're from a series called Porches. Um, and do you, do you wanna talk a little bit about um, what brought you there and um, why you started making these pictures? These are, the, these are the afternoons after school, you know, school. So I'm teaching in an elementary school in Rock Hill, South Carolina, and then later in uh, Mississippi as well. Um, so I, I had no idea how the kids in my class were living. And of course, in many cases, there was no running water. These are not necessarily my students, but they're part of the families of some of my students. Um, so I think it was just a natural progression to move out from the classroom in that part of what I was teaching was with Shuba pinhole cameras and Polaroid cameras eventually. To, to encourage kids to go out into the world. So this was the world, their world, that I was sort of being introduced to them in some ways. And this also, um, around this time, you, you began work um, in a town called Lando. And I had never seen this project before, and it, it's in the book In History, for those of you who know Susan's work. But what we're looking at here are some Polaroids um, of some children who you worked with. And I find it so interesting how this project becomes a kind of um, template for, for ways in which you work in the future. But do you wanna tell us a little bit about, about this project and how it came about? Well, Lando was not far from the, the school I was teaching in the elementary school. And I met the minister's wife, Judy and her husband, Charles. And they were interested, this is right around the time of the bicentennial. So it's the summer before 75, 74, 75, right in the cusp. And we were really, it was a workshop with kids who were elementary into early middle school. 
uh, working with Polaroid, which who was incredibly generous at this time, giving cameras and, and film to not just myself, to many, many uh, people who were teaching, with, teaching photography in the early 70s. And what we ended up doing was a combination of their photographing their families in the landscape of the town, which had been a mill town and the mill had closed. So this was, you know, I haven't been back and this is one of those places that uh, I wanna go back to and actually had thought about going back to pre-COVID recently um, through an invitation of someone, Judy, Judy, the minister, minister's wife. But what you're seeing on the right are the people of the community listening to the stories that the kids gathered. So here I am telling you about a kind of working process that I carry through my life, though I don't, re I wouldn't have known that that would have been true at this time. And what you see behind them are these, this idea of a genealogy. So the kids would either make photographs or collect photographs from their families. And they tried to trace the relationship of their families that had stayed in Lando because it was already a town with migrating populations leaving the town. I find what, it, yeah, go ahead. I find it really interesting to think about, um, you know, you and I have talked about the fact that, you know, there was no arts education. And so you were thinking about building a curriculum and the idea of working with children um, creates this kind of social practice that just is um, organic in a way. And, and that is a kind of practice that created this interest in a vernacular and in an oral history um, mm -hmm. that really you can trace all the way through to Kurdistan, but you can trace through all of your projects really in the way that you think about even carnival strippers, this idea of um, you know, the Polaroids that you gathered in that project. So I think there's something about that role of education and building a, a sort of community of partners that I find really fascinating and I see the roots of it in this project and it's, it's wonderful to learn about. There are also some question about, you know, who are the pictures for? So this mm -hmm. connection back for the person who it's made of, is it a value to them? To what extent it serves for this community? I think this was an amazing project because people just sat for hours and hours listening to their neighbors and looking at the pictures of those who had come before them in this town. Seems like something that would be useful today actually. And that, it's an interesting kind of um, comparison, I think, with Prince Street Girls, because um, in a way, um, you see, you, you were sort of collaborating with children to create a project at Lando. And that's what you see on the left is these kids um, with these vernacular pictures. And then, you know, you come back to, to New York and you live in, in Little Italy and all of a sudden you find kids on the street and you begin collaborating with them, but in a different way and that you become interested in taking their pictures. Um, and I think you were also interested in, in the sort of relationship of the pose here. So I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about what is the project Prince Street Girls and was it even a project? How did it come to be? Yeah, well, how do you define a project? I mean, these were speaking about not knowing my neighbors in the one boarding house. This is the contrast. Of course, I don't know my neighbors in Little Italy but I start to meet these kids on the street and they were kids. They were anywhere from eight to 10 or 11 at the time I first met them, um, hanging out, you know, after school. I, it wasn't, I don't, you know, the word project with a capital P, it was really just, again, finding through photography, finding ourselves beginning to have a relationship. Um, they would come up to my loft on the same, you know, within a block of where they lived and, and see the pictures that I was printing. Um, and I would, in, you know, I would crisscross the path of Mott Street and Prince Street, meeting them, doing any number of things, preschool, after school, on weekends, kids that you don't see today in my neighborhood, but who were very present in that period of the 70s. It's a totally different time. Um, and it, for me, was so reminiscent um, of the work, in some ways, of Helen Levitt, whose picture you see on the left, mm -hmm. in part because she was a woman who photographed children on the streets of New York. And you are really not someone I think of as a street photographer, whereas I would say that Helen is more of a street photographer. She did walk the streets to take pictures. And she even used a right angle viewfinder in order to be sort of um, separate and unknown so that so that they wouldn't know that she was taking their picture. But I sort of get the sense that 
she was well known enough around the neighborhoods that she could be ignored regardless. But um, there is this sense of play she captures that I think I see in your pictures as well. I know she doesn't follow the same group of girls. It's more um, the idea of play in, in youth in general. Um, but I really love these pictures of yours on the, on the right where you see the kids really sort of lost in their own world. And I wonder if you wanna talk about what it was like to, to capture these budding relationships. Well, again, they're just, they're just being who they are. I mean, um, it's interesting your point about the right end angle lens. Uh, obviously, they know I'm making photographs, and sometimes I think they're making photographs, they're making, you know, they feel my presence, they see me, but whether or not they understand really, and it's such a different time when you think about today, the innocence then compared to everyone making selfies with their phones today, these kids included, now that they're in their 50s, but um, you know, I, what was a photograph then? You know, what did they understand? It took years and years before these photographs ever had a public life. It was really, you know, I shared them with them at the time and they were buried for quite a long time, actually. I mean, you, so you took pictures of them throughout the years. Um, and we yeah. interviewed Lisa, who's in this picture on the left, um, and Jojo. And so it, if you, um, at home, take a virtual tour with us, you'll be able to hear from them because they've known Susan now for 50 years. Um, and of course they've, they were there when Little Italy was a very different kind of neighborhood. But the picture on the right is also one I, um, I think of in a way, like I, I think of the pictures we talked about um, from the seventies of almost a picture that captures the feeling of a generation, but also the feeling of youth, um, the feeling of freedom, a feeling of being yourself with your friends. Yeah. You have to also imagine these, the girls, they were limited to Little Italy. So this was a big adventure to go to the beach together. And the, I think Lisa speaks in our interview with her. Lisa, on the picture on the left is Lisa on the right and her dear friend Dee, who died a number of years ago. And she speaks of the loss of Dee, that they've known each other. This group of girls have known each other all their lives was really important for her to tell us and who would know that making this photograph at that time? Um, I'm fascinated kind of like the way a photograph registers a moment in time. And then of course you don't know. In this series, I'm really staying as close to them as I can for a number of years that I'm based in, in Little Italy. And you're also someone I think who's interested in um, capturing sort of that, that moment of of preparation of who someone might become. And I think of adolescence as that kind of stage. So in a way, this entire series of pictures is, is capturing um, a group of girls on the cusp of becoming, which is very central, I think, to the kinds of things that motivate you. Yeah, and you have to imagine that I'm also doing this parallel to the strippers, which is what I'm photographing in the summers there you go. So the, you know, very different, those women are becoming in a very different sense, but a transition also in their lives. And of course, on the left, we see Lena, who was one of the sort of central figures in carnival strippers. And um, here we talk too, I think about this role of immersion and, and what it means to get to know the people and to get invited in sort of behind the scenes and also to really start to understand um, the girl show, which was women perform performing striptease at county, county fairs around New England, um, in particular at a time when the women's movement really looked down on this kind of work. And I think the thing that fascinates me so much about this project is that you were interested in hearing their perspectives and making sure that other people heard them as well and thought about why someone would see this as an opportunity. Um, but I also have to say that you know, this is a black and white series. Um, and we combed through some of the, some of the outtakes in your um, archive for the virtual tour. And I was so thrilled to see this picture on the right of the Ferris wheel in the background. Um, but I, I didn't realize you'd been taking pictures in color um, during carnival strippers as well. So mm -hmm. there's a lot to talk about here, but I wonder if you could start by talking a little bit about the pose um, and about what captured you about this moment really in both of the photographs. 
Well, it's funny because I keep thinking about the color and I want people to remember why it was so difficult to work in color because it was ASA 25 for those of you who are, you know, are analog photographers. It's unimaginable to anybody with an iPhone that you wouldn't be able to make a photograph in color at the time. time. Outside, so in the inside, it was even more impossible that, you know, one light bulb was all we had. I didn't use flash. Everything is a handheld moment. I'm at, you know, I'm in the same relationship in both of these photographs in the sense that I'm in the public fairgrounds along with everyone else looking at women and looking at men looking at women and looking at men controlling the women who are performing themselves. And progressively they move from that public fairgrounds to the interior space, the dressing room, which I then enter the next summer and then the backstage. So I see it as this, um, they're there to lure men in. And as they say, ladies and no babies. And, and what you referred to about the sound was very important right from the beginning. I needed to capture all the, those perspectives, the managers, the boyfriends, the girls, the girls to the men, these various interactions between them. So I was recording sound constantly as much as I was making photographs. And I'm glad the, the exhibition actually has that sound. I mean, in the physical exhibition, if anyone gets to the man when it's open at some point, you will hear the collage of sound, the original sound, but it's also a part of the virtual. Um, and, yeah, the and this, this is one of those moments that are kind of amazing because I happen to capture Lena who's on the left on her very first day coming to the fair and she comes looking to dance and says she can dance. She knows how to do it. And she's got a garbage bag full of clothes. She's running away from her husband. Um, and two summers later, she is harder core. She kind of knows how she wants to look or how she wants to be seen, which is why I love these two portraits together on the wall. Um, she's so transformed by the work um, within such a short time. She really starts to inhabit the pose, the, the pose in, a, in a way where she seems to understand more what it means. And then, you know, we also have your contact sheet so that people can see, um, first of all, what a contact sheet might look like. Um, and then, you know, thinking about you bringing these back so that the girls could see their pictures, because really you're taking these pictures for them. Yeah. Yeah. So their initials are on which pictures they like more than others. And you can just see them trying to figure out how to present, you know, and I'm not directing them. So it's kind of like, be who you want to be. Just, um, I'm just there as your mirror in a kind of way. Uh, but this is also two and a quarter, which is interesting to think about the four or five and the two and a quarter, neither of which I'm really as, as um, it's not really my, my favorite. I really love the like and the lightness of and the quietness of the like in this period but it's the appropriate medium. And I just pulled this in because um, I really, talking about the pose, that sort of um, way in which Lena looks like she is um, trying to strike a pose that she has seen in a magazine. And I think so much about um, other women who have captured women and the fact that, that girls are sort of taught that they should look this way. And that um, you, sometimes when they pose this way, they they don't even look like they're comfortable doing it, but they've been taught that it's the way to pose. And mm -hmm. so, um, you know, with Renika Dykstra, who works in a very different w manner than you with a large format camera that she takes to the beach and makes um, very large scale color pictures, but you can see on the ground um, how the girl has sort of posed many different ways for her, just all the, her footprints in the sand. And so thinking about that encounter, that relationship, you know, Renika not actually knowing this girl the way you might have known Lena and yet both of them striking that pose because they know it's the way to look. Yeah, though the other thing to think about is that, I mean, this is the first day I meet Lena, though I know her for a number of years after that. And what I love about Renika's work is some of her work has also done that kind of catching in and following someone over time. She has some wonderful series where she does that, though this, the Beach series is not as true for that series, but I think the um, there are a lot of bodies of her work where she goes back and finds people over time, like Elmarisa, um, exactly. refugee. Yeah. 
So I think what's so interesting and important about this um, series, Carnival Strippers 2, is that you're not just looking at the presentation on stage, <clears throat> but you're backstage and you're really interested in the working life of these girls and not just the working life, but the performance they have to enact, the magic they need to create and the energy it takes to do so. And so I love this picture of Shorty on the left. I think it's probably my, my favorite picture in the entire um, body of work. But I love hearing you talk about um, making this photograph. <clears throat> and I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about, since, since both of these pictures are of Shorty, um, what, what drew you to these moments? Mm. Well, I think it, it's, hmm, what can I say? There's something about the waiting for the night to run out, you know? She's running out onto the stage, performing for three minutes to a 45 record. The, um, it's interesting, you can, I don't know if anyone else could tell and know that this was Shorty. I mean, she's wearing a, ri a wig in the, on the right um, and wanted me to see the night behind the stage. So they're opening the curtain for me to see the men and see the work that they're doing. But she's waiting for that night to be over. Um, she's waiting for whatever the girl that's on stage to be finished. Um, and the girl on stage, <clears throat> I mean, the, you've also photographed the girl on stage from such a low angle that it's very much like the Lena picture of the ballet box where mm -hmm. she becomes so statuesque and so larger than life because you're looking up at her and, she, and she's also blurred. And so she has this kind of sense of, um, of magic, of creating something that, that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I, of course, um, couldn't help but think of Manet's Olympia from 1863 and think about the difference between a woman photographing women working and a man making a painting for um, consumption, really, of, of a woman's body and the differences um, between um, what you get when you have that perspective. Mm. And also um, even thinking in photography of Cartier-Bresson who made this picture in Spain in the 1930s um, and took portraits of um, prostitutes very often, but clearly with a different goal and a different perspective, um, sort of enjoying their seduction, but also their play. Whereas I think on the left, you really see Lena's exhaustion um, and you are, you are spending a lot of time with her. So you are um, seeing sort of being more empathetic of her experience than perhaps um, what Cartier and Brisson's experience was. Mm. Well, there's definitely not a, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm doing laundry, I'm living in the hotels, I'm going out, I'm there all day and all night, moving town to town with them, bringing, you know, going back to Boston, making, you know, processing the film, bringing the contacts back, they're seeing the contacts. So they're seeing themselves being seen by me, which is a very important, Interesting, because of course today and with digital, that doesn't seem like much of anything, but at the time it really, it was important kind of intentionality to share the process as best I could. And I, I think one of the things that um, I find also compelling sort of in this series and throughout is um, again, this, this sort of liminal sense um, of you concentrating on that moment of transition. Um, and you speak about the curtain as a metaphor within the, the text of the book, but also just looking at that picture on the top left of, um, you know, she's pulling the curtain back and, you know, the girl who's in, I think it's Debbie, who's in, in sort of the waiting room is just kind of smoking. Um, but you can see the man through the curtain and that sense of like, okay, now I must prepare to to perform um, and what happens in that space between the, the sort of dressing room and the stage um, and, and what kind of safety that offers. But do you wanna talk a little bit about um, what drew you to that and, and what else you see there? Well, I love that you brought these four pictures together on the wall because the, you know, the curtain is, is definitely, I mean, you see Shorty in the bottom left, it's Shorty looking through, watching another girl dance and as you see on the upper, we have the voice of Debbie talking about what she needs to do to look beautiful, to pretend she's beautiful, but not to, not to connect with anyone. Lena's running on the stage 
from the upper right, which gives you a sense of how much pressure they were under to constantly perform. These were, you know, maybe shows that lasted anywhere from 15 to 30 minutes. And then they would be, build a new audience and they would go from five o'clock in the afternoon till one in the evening. So it's long, long days. I've always loved the bottom right picture as the symbol of, of the, the self-determination, that kind of resistance, that incredible um, confidence at the same time that they had to do what they were doing and they had some sense they would survive it. I'm not sure I would have at the time. And we also talk about the um, fact that women's bodies have shifted since this time, that these are the sort of much more real um, with scars and, you know. Bruises. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, I think there's something that's shifted in our culture, especially in the way we um, expect women to not just perform, but to appear. Yeah. And so that brings us to um, a series of pictures that I had never seen before, uh, women in the US Army, which were taken in 1975 and 1977 when you were photographing um, at Fort Jackson in, was it South Carolina? Yeah. Um, at the basic training for um, women in the Army. And, you know, I'm so struck, we keep talking about the, the idea of a bridge, but that this series for me is a real bridge between carnival strippers and between what you will later do in Nicaragua. Um, this sense of um, what are the opportunities that are available to women in the United States and why might someone join the army? Um, but also when you're making these pictures, you're not just photographing um, the moments of impact, but really inside and outside of training to really understand the lives of the women, but everything from preparing with their gas masks to preparing with their mascara, um, which of course is something that I wouldn't imagine men were trained in. But um, for me, this was, a, this was a real revelation to find these pictures. Well, you know, the other thing about, to think about with the women in the army is that um, there's a line that Lena says that you hear in the sound. She says something about being a stripper as close to being in the men's world as one can be. She loves the idea that they're groveling at her feet. And this is kind of the reverse. Women, you know, wanting to be part of a male core. And at this time there were huge debates about whether or not women were ready and could be made ready to be on the front lines. So what being on the front lines meant, you know, they could do the cooking and they could do the nursing, but could they really fight? And that's what's really interesting about what I didn't know when I was photographing, you know, the basic training in 76 is that two years later, I'd be in Nicaragua where women are fighting, no training, just right in the middle of an insurrection. And it's interesting to think about, um, you know, we've talked so much about you building a relationship with um, your subject, but there's also the subject building a relationship with the collective or, you know, women building relationships with men. And so we start to see that also playing out. And mm -hmm. I think for me, this, this um, seeing women in the US Army was a really, gave me a new perspective on Nicaragua because I think I, I for so long have um, known all the pictures like the picture on the left, um, really iconic picture of the Molotov man, um, which of course is fascinating. And um, there's so much to talk about with the Nicaragua series. But I think in this exhibition, what's interesting for me is that we start to see how you also were really looking at the roles of women. And um, that becomes apparent in the pictures. And so, you know, the picture on the right um, of a woman who is sort of thrust into combat, does she get trained the same way the women were getting trained in the US Army? And, you know, women in the US Army weren't really ending up in combat in this way. Um, so it's, it's an interesting um, bridge again. Yeah, and of course I'm seeing these and then thinking about 10 years later when I go back to make pictures from revolution, I find Marta, who's the woman in the center of the picture. And I also find the young boy who then has been sent off to Cuba to be trained. And the man behind her is somebody who's now already left Nicaragua and is in Canada. So I'm, I'm looking at a moment in time and that's also what's important about the iconic image of the Molotov men because Samosa leaves the evening after that picture is made. So for the Nicaraguans, this, this image becomes symbolic of the 
the ultimate moment of the popular insurrection that overthrew Samosa. And so, you know, then that picture has its own kind of life independently, the life of the man that's in the picture. So I think one of the things that happens for me in Nicaragua is I'm not, I'm, I'm also starting to interrogate the ways in which photographs live in the lives of my subjects. Again, it's kind of back to some of the themes we've already touched on, but you, you don't always have long-term relationships with the people, but then you do have these complex relationships to the images that you make that have lives of their own, as I said. And the Molotov man continues to unfold a, a life independently of me. And then there, um, again, you know, you, you know, you, you go to um, Nicaragua in 1978 because you see something in the newspaper that draws your attention to this um, uprising, this insurrection. And it's really something that's a, a divergent path from what you've been looking at before, which had been more sort of domestic stories. And, you know, I think you say something in the, in the virtual tour about no one, no one saw my pictures from carnival strippers and thought, you know, she should go to Nicaragua. But I think um, that idea of immersion, even if you're not getting to know the people, you're getting to know the culture, you're getting to know the place. And because you bought your own ticket, you're there for much longer. And so you start to see things, I think, that maybe perhaps others wouldn't have, such as, um, you know, the picture on the right of the women who are waiting outside a jail to find out if, if their family members, their husbands, their sons have been imprisoned or on the left, um, the picture of, of, you know, this protest that you discover. And do you want to talk a little bit about? Um, well, and, yeah, I think that the, the um, I didn't know this was Arlen Sue at the time I made the photograph, but I find out later that she was a martyr. She had died in the mountains. So, you know, when this, uh, this is a, it's not actually a protest, it's a funeral carrying four coffins through a town of Hinotepe. And when they pass Arlen's family's home, they bring out the photograph from their living room. So talking about photographs and how do they live in memory of someone on the wall, the family brings it forth and it's carried around the town. Um, do you think the funeral in some way acted as a protest though? Or was it, I mean, this idea of coming together or was it simply just a, a memorial? No, it, it begins as a memorial. And, and of course, these are all university students, many of them you know, that were, had been killed. So there's a fury in the town. So it's, it has an insurrectional feel, but it's not that different than what we were feeling on the streets of the Black Lives Matter. It's kind of like enough, enough, mm -hmm. that kind of feeling. And so it was under the organization of FSLN, which is the Frente Sandinista, Liberación Nacional, and that was definitely the organizing group. These, all these, the people in the streets are not ne necessarily formally organized, but they're responding to a sense of the urgency of what, what's happening around them. So the other thing that um, I was truly excited about, especially in, in, you know, putting together this virtual tour over the course of the past six months is we um, found this, interview that you did with um, feminist writer and author, writer and curator Lucy Lepard in 1992, where you talked about these postcards, um, yeah. that you had brought postcard paper down to Nicaragua. Um, and, you know, I was thinking um, about the fact that no matter where you go, you sort of um, create a collective in a way, or you, you try to think about ways in which you can um, help other people or bring them together around photography. And so I, I, I was thrilled to learn about this. And do you want to talk a little bit about what these postcards well, are? I think the question was really, what can you contribute, especially as a foreigner, especially with the privilege of a passport coming and going? This is through the Contra War. Some of, some of the people I hope on this call would remember uh, the covert war that was launched under Ro uh, Reagan and, you know, was very aggressive against Nicaragua at the time. So all the Kodak stores closed. So the photographer community I had known, I had worked with and um, had no materials and, and their economy. Lots of photographers are thinking now in terms of COVID in this way, but, you know, they, they had nothing to work with. So bringing a box and they used to come in like 500 sheet boxes, this fantastic postcard paper that was all, as you can see on the back, it was pre 
determined. All you had to do was add the address. And they printed their photographs and would sell them in the hotels and sell them to tourists who were still coming down to Nicaragua. So it was a wonderful exchange and a kind of, kind of collective project at the time. Really interesting too to think about the kinds of pictures that we would we did not see from from that period because there was no paper available to the people who lived there. Yeah, so these are Nicaraguan photographers making postcards of their favorite pictures of moments in Nicaraguan life that we were most likely not seeing. You know, the literacy campaign, which is on the left, etc. Yeah. And then, um, you know, I think we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the fact that, you know, we've, I, you keep saying things like, well, now with digital <laughs> photography, but you know, of course you were photographing with film and sending it back to New York. Um, and so you weren't seeing any of the pictures you were making until they were published and sometimes published on the cover of the New York Times magazine. Mm. Um, do you want to talk about, I mean, so here we're looking at the same photograph, but different kind of mediations of it. And that's something I think that's also central and we could spend hours talking about that. Um, but, but I wonder if you wanna talk a little bit about um, the relationship and, and the sort of life an image has in different contexts. Yeah, well, I love that in the exhibit, we have the mural that was actually in the street of Monimbo where the photograph was originally made. So the mural on the right is at the 25th anniversary of the overthrow of Samosa, whereas the picture on the left is my first cover, first time I'm working with the media. And I say with rather than for, because it really wasn't on assignment. I was really there. I came back. In fact, in this case, I'd been in Nicaragua for six weeks and came back to see my film because again, Kodachrome, you had to process. It took two or three days, et cetera. So I came back, saw my film, and then went back down again. And the Times had sent a writer down independently. And so that's how this magically came to be. And that, it's, it's a very transformative thing. Uh, you know, carnival strippers lived under my bed for years and until it was made into a book and, and an exhibition. It didn't have a public life the way this photograph did. Um, so of course, when I went back for you know, the pictures, pictures from revolution, the central figure here is someone named Justo, uh, who's a shoemaker in Monimbo and was the person that would invited me into this setting, which was an underground cell. They were practicing making contact bombs. And I've always been struck by why he trusted me. And also this is a kind of portrait I would normally not be comfortable making. It's again, it goes back to performance in a way. It's, it's not a pose, they are literally, letting me know that they know how to make contact bombs and they know how to make them and throw them. And uh, therefore it's a kind of, it's an act of defiance that they want captured. So in a way I felt like I was just there to capture what they wanted to portray of themselves. Yeah, like even though they're wearing a mask, this is not a mask. This is them without the mask. Well, the mask protects their identity from anybody right. else knowing who they are. I know it's Justo. I know where Justo lives. And in the film, I go back 10 years later to talk to him about this moment, which we also have in the gallery. And I'm very happy people will hear him in his own words talk about his life. And, you know, you have um, worked in public um, in, in various ways. And we talk about conflict um, in Nicaragua, but but there's conflict in domestic violence that is in, invisible, insidious. Um, we don't talk about it socially very often. And so in 1991, you were invited by the Liz Claiborne Foundation to um, make work for a public, the first public awareness campaign for domestic violence in San Francisco. And so on the right, you see your final um, bus shelter. Um, and on the left is a picture that, um, I mean, aside from the bruise might be an advertisement, but you know, I, I find it so interesting to think about ways in which you were thinking about visualizing domestic violence and what would really make an impact. Do you wanna talk about the picture on the left and how you ended up with the picture on the right? Now the, the commission was to, to be part of this public awareness campaign, but there was no direction as to what we would do, we could find our own path. And I, of course, started thinking about the police, the hospitals, um, sites where there was evidence 
you could say, of domestic violence. Um, and then in my passing, I met Susan Briel, who's the district attorney, who was unbelievably welcoming and sharing of information that was in the public domain. And I began to read the testimonies of the detectives, of the neighbors, people reporting on these various incidents and seeing at the same time some of the work that the detectives themselves had made. So it became less about making the photographs and more about making the, making the issue more visible in a way that was also protective of identities in a different way than we're talking about masks in Nicaragua. But um, the woman on the right is a woman named Irma whose husband had slashed her wrists and arms and nearly stabbed her mother to death uh, in, in the local, in the, in the family restaurant. And um, we, you know, in the exhibition, it's really important to me that people will hear Irma's voice. So she's a survivor. Um, and uh, she goes on. I think her restaurant's been closed in COVID times, but she's she's determined to you know to succeed and move on. So I I think these are you know the photographs uh, are only part of the story. And that's um, definitely I think even in the virtual tour, the the being able to hear directly from Irma and being able to hear um, you speak with Susan Briel, who is now a judge, but who was then in the district attorney's office um, and what that, how that became a collaboration. And I think that's such an insight into um, not only how you work, but how, how you think. And so I hope people will spend some time with that. You know, it's, it's also not being fixed in the, what you're doing, but responsive in some way. You know, I mean, I wasn't invested in my photographs. I was really interested in the idea. How do you get this idea? How do you make this idea visible in a way that the public can, can process? And, th you know, this is a project that happens in quite some time later, almost 25 years later, in which the issue of domestic violence certainly hasn't gone away. Um, this is part of a project called A Room of Their Own. It's sort of suiting to end with this because I feel the presence of these women. I'm protecting their identities. They're not present in the rooms, but the rooms are like mirrors of their identities, their psychology, their, their struggle to survive again. Uh, this is a project called A Room of Their Own in a shelter in the north northern uh, UK in the coal country, which has been devastated by domestic violence. Well, and uh, in fact, Milwaukee has a, um, a high rate of domestic violence. And so, you know, one of the things we seek to do is to offer um, a platform for our community voices. And so we will be hosting a program. We have two community partners, Sojourner Family Peace Center here in Milwaukee and Lotus Legal, um, who provide legal services to women who have been trafficked or um, experienced domestic violence. And so, um, with that, I just want to uh, mention our upcoming programs in association with the exhibition. Um, the first of which is um, Collaboration of Potential History of Photography, which really speaks to a lot of the themes we discussed tonight, but we will invite you with Wendy Ewald, Ariella Azule, uh, Lee Rayford, um, Laura Wexler, to discuss a project you've been working on now for some years. Um, so I'm very much looking forward to that. And then the, the panel I mentioned in which we will discuss the role of photography um, and personal narrative in uh, domestic violence campaigns, um, but where we will hear directly from survivors. Um, so before I open it up to questions, I just wanna take everyone into the virtual tour um, so that we can show you sort of how to, how to use it, but also maybe um, show you one of the videos. So I'm just going to... Yeah, everyone has to know that this is how we survive COVID. <laughs> By obsessing on trying to figure out how we could transform space into an experience. We certainly did. Susan and I um, recorded many hours of audio, but also just talked so much about the pictures. And to me, that was the most valuable experience. And it really gave me something to get excited about. Um, so here's the museum's um, exhibition page and what you'll do is when this goes live tomorrow, you will click on the virtual exhibition and it takes you in. 
You can see the little doll house from above. There's also a banner on the bottom of the page that you can open up that will take you in order through the various sections of the exhibition. But if you come down to the title wall, um, there's my audio introduction. There's a kind of navigation field that tells you um, not just how to move around, but also gives you the color coding. So what we did in, in this um, virtual exhibition was really try and present as many different perspectives and voices as possible. So you'll have my voice, of course, and you'll have Susan's voice, but you'll also have um, various participants and collaborators, and you'll also have Susan from historical footage. So there's various ways in which you can experience. Um, and then if you click here, it will bring you right to the first wall. And I just wanna show you this video. I just... Nope, sorry. I remember feeling I was boxed in as a woman photographer photographing women. Am I doing it because I'm a woman or is it because I'm a woman? I'm able to place myself differently. I'm consciously interested in what's happening with women, but I'm just the generation after those who fought the hardest politically, the ERA movement just before me. If you're looking at the 50s and then what's earned in the 60s and then what women in the beginning of the 70s are feeling, right? They're on the streets, they're burning their bras. There's a progressive collective movement building and I don't have to be on the streets. I can actually just feel it, that I'm empowered in that sense to look, to be, to endeavor, to explore, to express. I'm just beginning to earn what others have fought harder for. I'm assuming I have the right to be there and I have a sense of my own value and what I can contribute by being there. I think I was just a woman in the 70s who felt I could be who I imagined myself to become and explore again as broadly as I could and challenge myself in you know a range of ways by those encounters which shape my life, they shape my thinking and they continue to in an ongoing way. So um, I do hope you'll spend some time investigating the virtual tour. I can't thank our team enough. Um, Ariel Pate, Ted Bruce Bartis, Dustin Dupree, Luciana Pinquiero, and uh, Jessica Ball, who did so much work putting that together. Um, and now I wanna um, open it up to questions. So I'm just going to take a look here and see. Um, I have a question. How has the digital camera affected your photography? Has it given you abilities you didn't have before? Or even Susan, do you use a digital mm -hmm. camera? Yeah, I was reluctant to go digital because of the quality of the digital in the early period of the 90s. But you know, it's very important. Those murals which uh, returned to Nicaragua are only possible because of digital photography. You know, when you think about what we can do with printing on mesh, mesh that can survive the rain and the sun, whatever. So in one way, the digital technology, uh, that was the first I was comfortable. And then of, of course I now work with digital. It's so hard to find anyone who even processes film. And I do love that you can share an image um, very intuitively in the way that Polaroid was a very special technology. I mean, I miss Polaroid, I still love Polaroid. The, the physicality of a Polaroid, which is a gift that you give away and you don't ever have again, and the digital file you can reproduce endlessly. So there are tremendous advantages and there's something also we've lost in the transition uh, that I still treasure. And now here's another question that I find um, fascinating actually, because I think um, 
it's interesting to think about not just your role as a photographer, but as a leader in the field. And so um, someone asks, seeing all of these community focused photos together, I'm curious how your history with these photos influences how you've led the Magnum Foundation. Mm. Well, I am interested in certain themes that first of all, um, I mean, we don't talk, we haven't talked much about it, but I was very involved through the period in Latin America with making other possibilities and opportunities for people from, from Latin America. So I was involved in training. I was in, in publishing work that had, wasn't my work, but work that they had done in El Salvador and Chile, uh, elsewhere. So I've, I feel as if, you know, I, I think of myself as being, you know, trying to bring eyes forward and bring diverse voices forward. So the Magnum Foundation is definitely continued to diversify the field, very focused on the global South and making, creating opportunities for greater visibility uh, and partnerships and innovation. And so innovation includes working in public space, doing work in performance, working in AR, which is really augmented reality, which is what we just did with this tour. Um, you know, exploring ways that narratives can continue to capture the imagination and share some intimacy. And I think the uh, foundation continues to grow and incorporate new ideas. You know, I'm now the president of the foundation, but Kristen Lubin, who is a former curator who I worked with, it's actually in 2008 to do the ICP, which was the first retrospective I did, the, the catalog in history. So we've known each other a long time. And I think of the whole team at the Magnum Foundation as a kind of collaborative um, orientation to what can we do? How do we expand the circles of inclusion and representation? Yeah, and I think, I think it's sort of inextricably linked. Um, there's no way to think of you as just a sort of photographer, but you are also someone who is invested in the field and is connected to many parts of, of the ways in which the field functions. Um, um, I have two questions that are, are related, one of which asks um, specifically the, the change to um, how cameras are now embedded in our phones has made people so much more aware of photography and how it might shape the landscape. But then this one is even more specific in that it asks, um, this person was struck by the side-by-side -side of Lena and as well with the comparison of Renika Dijkstra's image and the very different moment we're in today. Um, young people are so much more aware of how they present and market themselves. Does that self-awareness and performativity that seems so much more a part of how people engage with each other today impact how you are able to photograph. Um, so that sense of spontaneous and awkward moments more di difficult to capture. So the question of how, how's it changed for you, but also maybe how, how's it changed for the field? Mm. Boy, that's a great question. Um, I think the, uh, somehow I'm not asking myself the question of how is my photography changing in relationship to that phenomenon? I think, you know, people photographing themselves, people recreating moments, reconstructing moments, presenting themselves in very different ways, both as photographers capturing and with that kind of visual language um, or, or the identities themselves wanting to control their representation. I'm comfortable with all of that, you know? I mean, I went to the 50th surprise birthday party for Lisa and I immediately felt like I was not needed to be the, the community photographer of that group of girls. They were all making pictures and sharing pictures and uh, they're more on Facebook and Instagram than I am. So I was, I stepped back in the last project during COVID alongside this one was collecting early photographs from my neighborhood in Little Italy that are from the, the rooftops that I discovered that people had been making, you know, and there, there they are, they're sunbathing and they're celebrating weddings and uh, communions. And I love discovering with my neighbors, these, this, you know, from their albums, photographs that had been isolated in various families, various families, but who coming together really speak of a certain time that's certainly long gone in Little Italy. So that's a contribution I can make. And maybe it's not making new photographs or maybe it will be in a way that I don't know now. And I think I can live with not knowing. 
So I have two questions here that are again related. Um, one person asks how you got your start in photography and whether you were inspired by other photographers. And then another person asked where your profound drive comes from. And I think that those are also linked. <laughs> I think maybe that is inherent, but um, you can answer. I don't know how you drive to be curious. I mean, how can one not be curious in this world? It's such a privilege to be able to, to wander, to connect, to reflect. Um, I mean, I, I remember actually after, <laughs> it's a funny thing to say now maybe to you all, but when I finished Carnival Strippers, which was, you know, a three plus year project and at the heart of everything, I was terribly connected and very, it was hard to make a book and let it go. It was kind of, I never thought I could care about anything quite as much. And then of course, within two years, I was in the middle of Nicaragua and, and that same question came up soon after. So I think you, you have to, um, something about staying open and not knowing where it's gonna lead you and trusting that intuition. Uh, I don't know if that's drive, but that's, that's kind and, of what I carry with me. Um, and photography, what about photography? Well, which aspect of photography? Finding, you know, there's, you know, as Lisa knows, that's sort of a provocative question because in doing this virtual tour, I, you know, I had crazy ideas when we put the body, we found this series on the bodybuilders from one day, I immediately went to Google and started looking for those women and found out that a number of them are still doing bodybuilding in Europe. And I want to find them. And I haven't found them yet. So photographs to me are these moments of intersection of possibilities of time. I mean, there is time in the photograph, there's time around how the photograph lives in time, how people in the time of the photograph change. There's so much dimensionality to explore. I don't think it's only making a new frame. It's maybe re-experiencing frames that you've made and bringing them into new contexts as we've just done here. And that leads us actually to the next question, which I think um, mm. is, you know, and it's interesting for me too, because, you know, in putting together this exhibition, there was so much where I thought, well, people just aren't going to get the full sense because putting pictures on a wall isn't really getting to know what Susan does or her work. And so this person has asked whether um, presenting this exhibition in the virtual realm seemed closer to what you might originally hope with your earlier work, bringing together text, image, and sound. Yeah, I think that's exactly, and I think if anything, I want to explore it further and make it even more immersive and experiential. It's still an awkward software. It's still a very, you know, innovative approach. I don't, I'm, I really love the multiple perspectives that we've been able to bring. I mean, I've always thought about the triangulation of the photographer, the photograph person as a subject. Obviously we think about viewers, um, but hearing voices has always been part of my practice. So Carnival Strippers, when it was first shown in 1975, you heard all the voices I was referring to in the open space of the gallery. And you will again, if and when MAM opens. And, and Pictures from Revolution was made with my partners, Alpha Gazzetti and Dick Rogers. And when we went back 10 years, of course I didn't know that I would install them now in the MAM, next to the still photographs that I had made, we were making a movie and the movie's 90 minutes. And so it took a while to think, why not make clips of each of these people and then think about the still photograph in relation to their life going on. So that's what you'll experience both in the gallery and in the virtu virtual tour, you'll hear their sense of how their lives have changed over 10 years. So I've been exploring this in lots of ways, which was why it was possible to do this in such a, you know, in the last few months, bringing back, finding early interviews that I hadn't looked at for decades and decades. I mean, I forgot I was with Charles Kuralt on the road when I came back from Nicaragua. You know, I was the young girl from the revolution as it were. So. I'm sort of rediscovering things of how I was being seen in my own lifetime that I'd kind of forgotten about. And I'm fascinated to watch that footage and to see how um, you still speak in exactly the same 
Um, you use the same language. You had the same sort of determination and rigor in as a very young person. So I find that kind of fascinating to see having met you later in your life. Um, there's an, an interesting question here. Um, how have the current discussions about the increased reluctance of the public to trust journalistic sources altered the ways you think about the role of photographs as documents? Yeah. Well, as you can see, I'm not totally comfortable with photographs just living on walls framed and separate from us, you know, so I'm always trying to, again, that word bridge, bridge them, bridge, find new ways of bridging to, and there are opportunities to connect us, but they don't always do that. Um, so maybe that's in a way part of why this approach has been appropriate for me. I don't think it is for everyone and every photograph I make, I don't go back to and return is something I value a lot, but I can't always go back and go back and go back. So the tension between going back and reflecting and going forward. Um, so photography changes. I think the ethical context remains an important one to continuously consider. So, you know, what do these photographs do for the people who are in them, for the communities around them, for us? Do we really, what can we really know through the photographic experience ourselves? You know, what can we really share? Uh, and what, what changes as a result of all that so-called awareness? You know, I think that obviously plagues me when I go back to the domestic violence work, which we were so convinced that if people knew about it, that would be enough. And that crisis line was of course crucial at the time, um, but it, here we are decades later. So I think this idea of return and rediscovery is um, really central to just even the idea of, I mean, I don't think of you as someone who finishes a photograph and then it sits on a wall. I mean, you've built a relationship, whether it's with the place or with the person. Um, and there's someone here who asks if, you know, if you could go back in time, is there anything you'd change about carnival strippers? I think mm -hmm. carnival strippers in particular is hard to return to because um, many of the people who you knew so well as part of that project are no longer living. But, you know, have, is that something you've thought about? Or have you returned to that perhaps through series like Pandora's Box? Oh, that's really interesting, which we're not showing, but I did go back to find the women in Carnival Strippers when the book was reprinted by Aperture. So that was about 30 years later. And Debbie was the only one um, who is still living. Shorty died a few years ago, but I did find Shorty. And amazingly, Shorty lived about a mile from the place she ran away from at age 16. Um, Lena had died and her mother had written me about that. I knew about her. She died in the 70s. Um, I think, you know, in the carnival strippers themselves, the girl shows were kind of closed up by the end of the 70s. So there was no girl show to go back to. The, the parallel you're drawing, which is interesting because I get to Pandora's Box, which is an S&M club in New York uh, in mid 90s because Nick Broomfield, who's a British filmmaker, had wanted to do a film about carnival strippers. And mm -hmm. I said, well, they're out there, you, you should go. And by the time he went, he discovered that of course, the, the culture, the ecosystem of girl shows was no longer throughout New England. So that's what he gave me a call and said, you should come check out Pandora's box. It's the nineties, it's carnival strippers in the nineties. So that's what led me there. And, you know, the minute I, I got off the elevator and I was in this 10,000 square foot loft of little rooms, a uh, fantasy play, it was kind of called the Disneyland of domination. I had to stay. So I think, you know, what draws you isn't always, um, it's not just what draws you, it's what holds you, it, what springs you back. I think you just kind of know. So um, I think I'm gonna ask you one more question and I think it's, hmm. it's a provocative one um, because you know, I joked earlier that we sort of were dubious about the title through a woman's lens because I think um, neither of us would agree that, that, you're, that these are just photographs taken by a woman. I mean, clearly um, 
that's not the most interesting question, but the idea of sort of examining what it was to be becoming during the women's movement is one that um, I'm interested in. And I sort of see you as a feminist, but I'm not sure that you would see yourself that way necessarily. Um, so there's a question here that this is not just work made through a woman's lens, but through a feminist lens. Your insistence on collaboration, contribution, encounter, inclusion. What was your involvement in the feminist movement in that early period and how did it shape your distinctly feminist practice? Yeah, well, I think, you know, it's um, just such a question. I mean, I wasn't wearing a t-shirt necessarily, but I fully identified. And so it is a difference of being the activist. Um, did I burn my bra? You know, I just wasn't wearing one, so I didn't have to burn it. Um, but I think that, that um, I, I couldn't not be involved with the issues of that time and the desires of that time for women. And I also felt, uh, you know, I felt empowered to be who I could be. And I say that in the, in one of those interviews, because that in itself was, was enough. And just to, to do the work, you know, to do the work. And I think that um, not always be celebrated for the work, though it might seem that way to some of you, it was, it's also a lonely path, just doing the work, um, believing that it can matter to the people who you're with and the, the people who might see the work. Um, so the question of being a feminist is such a kind of narrow, capital F, feminist, active, embodied spirit of feminism, yes, for sure. Well, Susan, I think for me, what you have built for the rest of us is something that I can't thank you enough for. And I think that that drive to create community and to build um, a photographic world in which um, we are more visually literate is something that, that you've really been invested in throughout your career and we are all the better for it. So I um, wanna thank you for this evening's conversation and for the past six months of intense conversation that all of you can enjoy through the virtual exhibition, which will either be in your email or you can find it online tomorrow on the website. Um, but please do join us for the upcoming programs and take a look at the exhibition, Susan Mizellis Through a Woman's Lens on mam.org. And can we say also that it's still an experiment and it might even change and it might even grow. And so, you know, tell us what you think. It's yes, we'd love to hear from you and we will continue to add to it. So um, we will keep you posted as we add new content. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you everyone for attending tonight. And um, I look forward to seeing you all either online or at the museum again soon. Thank you, Susan. Thanks, Lisa. Wonderful to be here with you. You too.